Hey everyone, welcome back to the shop. So, some of you might have seen my previous video where I tore down that laser scanning sensor and pulled this neat little actuator out of it. Uh, if you haven't seen that, I would go check it out. But to very briefly summarize, this is a cross blade flexure hinge with a little coil on the back that allows us to pivot this uh, shaft back and forth like that. I thought this was a really neat little device and have been thinking about you know, what to do with it. And in the meantime, I realized it can be kind of used as a speaker. And so I hooked up an audio amplifier to it, clamped this to a table and used it to shake the table and you could effectively use it as a speaker, which was kind of cool. Then that got me thinking, you know, what's stopping me from putting a cutting tool on this, shaking the cutting tool while I'm say facing off a part on a lathe and more or less cutting my own records. And now I'm very deep in a rabbit hole and that's what brings us here today. So let's look at what I've done, what the plan is and how we can turn this into a record cutting device. So in order to cut a record, what do we need to do in the first place? The RIAA, which is the group that sets the standards for these sorts of things, has a standard for what a record groove looks like. This isn't a great picture, but it's a 90 degree V, and the standard depth is 1.1 thou, and the standard width is 2.2. So this is the profile we need to impart on whatever we're cutting uh, with our tool. Normally this is done with a heated ruby needle in a lacquer coated disc. But what we have, what I've purchased for this is this guy. This is gonna be really difficult to see, but there you, there you can get a glimpse of it. This is a monocrystalline diamond uh, cutting stylus. So basically the angle is exactly 90 degrees. It's super, super sharp. It's a monocrystalline tool, just like you would use on the diamond turning lathe, for example. Hint, hint, that's coming up later. And yeah, we can use this to cut that profile into whatever we want to use as a record. You can imagine if we just were able to hold that diamond at some distance from the, uh, the shaft here, you could wiggle that shaft back and forth and that would uh, sort of create the, the path we want in our record. Now there is a catch here. If we just take our diamond and wiggle it back and forth like this, that's not how modern stereo records are necessarily done. Uh, the way that they work nowadays and will have worked since stereo records were a thing are that undulations normal to this plane is gonna be one channel. There's two pickups, right? There's a, there's a coil here and the magnet that goes through it, and then a coil here and a magnet that goes through that. And then your needle is, you know, something like, it's got a one thou radius or so, connected to both of them. So if this moves like this, that magnet goes in and out of the coil, you get one channel of your audio, and if this has any undulations like that, you get your other channel. So with this method where we're just directly wiggling the diamond from side to side, laterally, we don't actually have the ability to cut stereo records. It's gonna be completely mono. Uh, and it's fine, that will still play on a stereo pickup. Uh, we just won't have true stereo. It'll just be both channels playing through both uh, both sides of the stereo. So a little bit of a downside there, but I still think this will be pretty neat if we can get it to work. Um, so what I've what I've done is gone ahead and machined this guy. Just whip this up real quick. A uh, little flexure here, just bandsaw cut, so we can mount this onto our shaft. And then right here in the end, we've got a mount for our cutting stylus. So the shaft goes in that 50 thou hole there. This little slot indexes it so it's, you know, at the right uh, angle. And then you got a little flexure to clamp it down. So this is what holds our diamond. 
on the little torsion actuator here is what I'm going to call it. And now when we play music through this, we can observe the diamond wiggling and hopefully if we are facing off a part uh, on the lathe while we do this, it'll effectively just cut a record. Um, now, let's talk about why this is not necessarily the best tool for the job. So let's say you want to cut a record. You've got your needle, your stylus, whatever you're going to use to do the cutting right here. And practically, it's controlled by two things. It's connected to everything else, and we can just call that a spring. We'll just call this the, uh, the rest of the structure there. And of course, you need a way to get the actuation signal into it to make it vibrate back and forth. So let's say we've got a little magnet there and a coil going around it. And we're going to play our waveform through this coil and that's going to cause this to shake back and forth and basically reproduce mechanically the waveform that's played electronically through this coil. That's the goal, right? Is to, trans is to turn that uh, electronic signal into a physical signal that gets written on the record. So here we run into why this is not ideal. This is the whole idea of frequency response. That is, if we were to drive this, say, if we were to just take these two wires coming into it and feed it a five volt peak to peak sine wave, um, say negative two and a half to positive two and a half volts. Let's say, just making up a random number, this would swing back and forth five degrees. When it goes plus two and a half volts, we got five degrees this way. And when it's minus two and a half volts, it goes let's say back to zero. So the total amplitude is five degrees. Now, if we were to play a five volt peak to peak sine wave at 20 kilohertz through the same wires, obviously the shaft would not move five degrees back and forth at 20 kilohertz. The gain of the output would be greatly reduced because the frequency is far too high and there's not enough power to actually generate enough force to drive shaft you know through that same that same sweep at that rate of speed so that's the whole idea of a frequency response graph right is because this has some finite mass and finite stiffness you know at very low frequencies called call this frequency here hertz and call this gain in decibels and that zero very low frequencies, it's just going to move, you know, the full, the full amount that it could given the voltage and torque that's applied on the shaft and the stiffness of the, the spring and all this. Eventually, there's going to be some resonance point where that's just the resonant frequency of this spring system here. And so when we drive it at that frequency, you actually get a positive gain and you see a huge spike. But everywhere else, it's pretty rapidly just going to drop off and you're not going to be able to realize the same gain at 15 kilohertz as you are at 30 hertz, for example. This makes sense. And this is the essence of the problem. If you're playing an audio waveform through this, if you're playing music, let's say you have, you know, a bunch of piano that's sitting right at the resonant frequency uh, at, you know, two kilohertz, for example that piano note or whatever is going to be way louder than say your hi-hat, which is way out here at, in the tens of kilohertz range. And so it's going to sound, you know, like you put your music through an equalizer, unbalanced. You might, you know, realistically, it's going to sound very compressed with a real physical actuator like this because you're going to lose all that high end and it's just gonna be really bassy and muffled because you're probably going to have near near zero, maybe even positive, definitely positive near the resonance down at the low frequencies. And this doesn't have a particularly high resonance frequency. And so you can see sort of the issue here. Ideally, right, this would have zero mass and a very, very low stiffness or something, something like that. And what you want your frequency response to look like is, you know, if you can help it, maybe something like this. And you can't have a truly flat one forever, but 
for the majority of the, the range of, you know, music frequencies, so up to 20 kilohertz at the most, it's relatively flat, something like that. But realistically, this is very difficult to achieve. Now, I can guarantee this actuator right here has something that looks a lot more that, like that, definitely not like that. Um, but there are ways around this. And so if we can just figure out what this graph looks like for this particular actuator, we can absolutely do something about this. So let's set, set something up, characterize this, and see how we can sort of mitigate this issue. And so here's that setup for testing the frequency response of our actuator. We've got the uh, Digilent Analog Discovery. We're using that as a signal generator to make our sinusoidal input to the actuator. The actuator itself is clamped down to the surface plate here. And kind of hard to see the setup, but we've got the capacitive gauge centered over, or not centered over it, but it's looking down at the swing arm of the thing. The diamond itself is not in there, and so technically you could make the argument that the frequency response curve is not going to be exactly accurate because there is that mass that's been taken away, but it's on the order of milligrams and this should get us close enough. But basically, you can see we're using the capacitive gauge to measure the actual displacement of the arm as it swings up and down. That's going into the oscilloscope here. As you can see, we still have pretty dirty power, so there's a noise floor that is limiting us right now. But the basic idea is we feed in our output and we start with something which is, you know, one hertz, so basically DC, so zero dB. And then as we ramp it up, so here's one kilohertz, for example, we look at the displacement reading. So note, this is the arm actually moving up and down as measured by the gap gauge. And we compare that to the amplitude from a uh, DC offset of the same, the same uh, voltage and you get, get our little, our data here. Now, I've not been able to sweep it all the way up because of that, that noise floor. Once that, uh, once we get a cleaner power supply, supply I'll be able to uh, take it all the way up to the higher frequencies where the displacements are going to be literally on the order of nanometers. Um, we don't have the ability to see that just yet. Uh, but yeah, that's the process as we just go through sweep frequencies and when we're done, we'll get a frequency response curve. And so if we take all that EQ data and plot it, this is what the curve starts to look like. Again, this part uh, isn't complete yet, uh, just because it's difficult to find a measuring instrument with a high enough dynamic range to be able to pull this whole curve off uh, in one shot. But regardless, if we take this now and use it as an EQ uh, and run, say, a song through it that we want to record, what this will give us is basically a preview of what the music that comes out of this actuator and the record that it cuts, what that's going to sound like if we don't apply any corrections, because this is basically a model of the physical system. So here we have, say, the song that we want to record for reference That's what you want to hear. But if we were to cut a record using that actuator with no corrections, what that would look like, or what that would sound like, if we apply that EQ to this song, is this. As you may be able to hear, Kind of sounds like we put the speaker under a giant pile of pillows. We've got no high end, 
super muffled, super compressed. Really not an acceptable sound quality. So what can we do about this? So the transfer function of our physical system looks like this, and we want it to be perfectly flat. So one handy little trick we can do is the music that we pipe through this thing. We run it through its own EQ, and what does that look like? The inverse of that of the physical actuator. So if we apply this to the song now, it's gonna sound crazy. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so this sounds horrible on my computer. That's because the speakers are already designed to have a flat transfer function, flat frequency response. So what happens is if we play this, this song now through that actuator, that torsion actuator, those two frequency responses that are inverses of each other, the gains will essentially cancel, if you will, and ideally we get a nice flat response out and the resulting groove that the, uh, the diamond cuts is of a good fidelity and we can actually demonstrate that here. If I invert this back, apply it again, it's like putting putting that original audio through the transfer function and one more time and then we're back back to the original audio quality so that's the idea that's how we correct for a non-perfect uh, cutting head um, of course you could try and try your best to design one uh, to be as ideal as possible and we can think about what that might look like but you're never going to get a perfectly flat response so the easy thing to do is find the, find the response curve and then invert any input going into it and hopefully we get a nice flat, flat signal out. So that's the idea. Now let's get it all put together and try it out. All right, so like I said in the intro in the video, now that we've got this little device which can vibrate a cutting tool, we can just stick it on the lathe, face something off and cut our records, right? Well, not quite. The problem we have, if I were to just bolt this on the lathe, is, you know, this is a big rolling element spindle with a motor bolted to the frame and there's vibrations, there's asynchronous air motion that comes from the spindle. And keep in mind, what we're doing when we're cutting a record is writing down very, very small amplitude vibrations onto the surface of a disc which we can then run a needle over later and play back. So if our spindle, say, has an asynchronous air motion profile where the dominant frequency, you know, spinning at 1,000 RPM is, you know, 2,000 hertz, that would get written into that groove as it spins around and the spindle is moving back and forth in the air motion. And then we go to play our record and Sure, the music will be there and the music will play fine, but we'll also get a sound recording of the lathe running built right into the record. It's gonna be recorded right over the top of the song and you may be able to hear the song, but you're also gonna hear all of the little rollers rolling in the spindle, the motor running, all of those very small amplitude vibrations which you wouldn't normally consider are going to be encoded in that physical groove and are going to play back as sound when you go and try and play the record. Now, if only I had a lathe that was very, very smooth, had no rolling element bearings, no asynchronous error motion, and could be used to uh, turn apart with a very high surface finish, no vibrations. Hmm. That's right. This is going to be the most overkill record cutting lathe of all time. What I'm going to try and do is use the diamond turning lathe as a record cutting lathe. So this makes you know, sense in a lot of ways. We're on an air bearing spindle. All the axes are on either air bearings or hydrostatic bearings. You really don't have a source of noise to interfere with the, uh, the song. I mean, the whole thing's on a vibration isolation table. So the idea here is I'm going to make a tool post that we can mount this 
in place of the current tool post that's on there and we'll cut our lathe on cut our records on here coupling on the back to interface with the standard spindle that we've got on there and then boss to register the ID of the CD and I've diamond turned the face in place such that the facial run out is exactly zero all right so let's look at how to mount this here we've got our CD we're going to use as a substrate to cut onto. I'm going to just make sure there's no dust hanging around on the hand roll. Make sure there's no dust on the CD. We can pop that on just like that. Sweet. Then I've got this little nut here to hold it in place. It's got a one thou relief, so we're bearing mostly on that outside there. A little knob. Go ahead and torque it down. Just like that. Ready to go. Okay, so here's the setup now ready to cut the record. We've got new tool post I made to mount the torsion actuator onto. The diamond is mounted on top. Can go like that. Got a crappy little amp to drive it and then can play the music that's been run through the EQ off the computer. So I gotta set the tool height, set the zeros and try and cut something. So after some preliminary messing around, here are the first, uh, some of the first tests and results we've gotten. Um, there are some problems that we're working out, and there's two big ones. The first is the parallelism of the substrate, or how you know consistent a CD is in thickness, or a DVD. And the second, which is related because the parallelism issue highlighted the second issue, is the uh, velocity control loop on the spindle actually was really not uh, up to the task um, of keeping this at a consistent speed. I had it tuned well for diamond turning, but the loads are so small there it doesn't take much to get a consistent speed. Here what was happening is because there was some amount of run out on the face, when the load would change once per revolution it would bog down the spindle and it wasn't responding fast enough. And I'll play this disc uh, in a moment. It's a really good demonstration of it. Um, but as a result, the music comes out way too fast because there is a steady state, or yeah, there was a steady state error uh, where it was going too slow while it was recording. So when you play it at the proper speed, it sounds too fast. And the other issue is because um, they weren't of a consistent thickness, the depth of cut and the size of the groove was changing a lot. So I've been having lots of problems with skipping, um, having to space the tracks out way more than I should um, to get them to not just all run into each other. The volume of the uh, input uh, song is also a factor in that, which I'm tweaking as well. So these two are the best results I've gotten. Um, this one is the best from a sounds most like the actual thing standpoint and this was an example of finally getting 
an appropriate track spacing. It's too large in practice, but um, this will also show what the horrifically um, bogged down spindle sounds like. And you can hear the once around error in the song. So here you can see the grooves on the best one we've cut so far under the microscope. I've put a little scale over it to give a sense of how large they are. Divisions here are 0.1 millimeter, around fourth hour or so. And you can see that the grooves are definitely wider than they should be, indicating too deep of a cut. And although they're decently spaced out, this is too much spacing, ideally. And even still, they're running into each other at some points. So that's why it has these skipping problems. Hopefully facing them off getting, and getting better control over the depth of cut will uh, allow us to minimize the uh, spacing and the depth as much as possible. We've just got one of the, you know, little cheapo briefcase turntables here in the lab uh, for immediate testing of the records. And first let's listen to what it sounds like when the velocity control loop can't keep up and you don't have a consistent speed. was you know the load changing because it was running out and it's speeding up and slowing down and in general just not going fast enough so it sounds super creepy and distorted but it at least plays um, this one is after some tuning on the control loop but the track spacing is not quite right because the depth of cut was still too large so I have to rest a pen on the uh, tone arm in order to get it to not just skip constantly. you can actually tell what the song is and you can hear it playing but there's a it's a lot noisier um, part of my theory there is this particular disc we turned on a mandrel on the normal lathe first to try and take out some of that run out but you can see it left a matte finish and it's possible that that surface finish is causing some of that noise there regardless let's look at what the next test is now that the velocity control loop is a little better tuned, uh, the last thing to address is just getting a consistent, even depth of cut the whole time. And so what we've done is prepared a few substrates by pre-diamond turning them on the mandrel and facing them off to get rid of any facial runout uh, and out of parallelism. I don't necessarily need them to be flat because the being clamped to the flat mandrel sort of gets out any warpage that's there. I just need the thickness to be extremely uniform. So now when you put these on the machine, you know, the runout's less than a couple tenths, and that should be good enough to get a nice consistent one thou depth of cut all the way across the face. You can see this one here, this did not get diamond turned all the way in. You can see that potato shape from it being of a very non-uniform thickness, and that's exactly what we're trying to remove. Um, we've got a couple DVDs like we've been trying, also laser cut out a couple of these acrylic substrates. Just going to try those out, see if those perform any better or worse. Um, they're a little thicker, these are an eighth inch, so a little more substantial and maybe not as flimsy. Um, acrylic does diamond turn better than polycarbonate, um, this is sort of not a traditional example of diamond turning, but who knows, maybe it'll sound better. So let's throw some of these on the machine and try them out. All right, so we've got an acrylic substrate mounted up on the lathe now, 
And we're just gonna come in and touch off with these stylus here. Yes, I am recording my computer screen with my phone. Sue me. I have the jog set on a continuous feed, uh, but the feed rate is 70 thou per minute. So if I do sort of medium sized button pushes like that, just hold it for half a second or so. Those jog movements are a couple tenths, but if I do a quick tap, we can feed in about a micron or so. So we're just gonna creep up here until we see the uh, reflection meet the uh, tip of the stylus. Boom, there we go. And we'll call that our zero. So here we are recording. As you can see, we've got a convenient solution for chip evacuation where it just kind of spools on the nut or the washer in the middle. Just like that. There it is, cutting, lots of glare. But it pulls that chip off pretty nicely and clears it. And uh, we just let that cook. Okay, so after a whole lot more testing, as you can see here, I've finally got it to a point where I'm decently happy with it at least for now, um, and we'll listen to it in a second, but I think it's, uh, I think it's at least serviceable. So the results of all this testing, the takeaways from this was basically the facial runout is critical. If there's more than two tenths of facial runout, the groove depth is not going to be consistent. The load's going to change too much. You're going to get tracks overlapping on each other and it just isn't going to turn out good. It ended up that acrylic was the way to go, these eighth inch acrylic pieces, simply because the CDs and DVDs are too hard to get parallel enough to work well. I mean, they're a lot flimsier, polycarbonate, so it's a little harder to get a nice surface finish on them uh, when prepping the substrate. And I, as you can see, I tried my best to make them work, but the best results ended up being with the acrylic pieces. This is also acrylic, just a neat, different color. Other things were, I added some pieces of foam to the nut here to apply a slightly more uh, consistent pressure and not as high a pressure on the disc. This is also indexed to the disc so it goes you know on the same you know angular orientation with respect to it every time just to make sure it's deflecting it the same way every time and after much strife I was able to sort of get down a process to where I could pre prep one of the discs, turn it, and then mount it on the diamond turning lathe again and have you know tenth or two facial run out. Anyway, these are the, these are a couple ones I've got boxed up here. These are gifts that I've made for, for some other people, just songs that they happen to like. But you can see there's the final cut on there. It's a three and a half minute song. Ended up going with five and a half thou groove spacing, which is wider than it needed to be, but I was playing it safe. And I think these turned out looking pretty cool. But do they sound good? That is the question. A 
Let's take a listen. extremely cheap and low quality turntable through my iPhone, they sound all right. Uh, I don't have a better way of recording it except putting my phone right in front of it, uh, but you're not missing much except for the fact that the bass actually comes through extremely well uh, with headphones. Um, just hard to capture it there. So I'm pretty pleased with this. Uh, I think the main comment or idea that I'm probably going to get if I could jump the gun here was why not just use a spring on the z-axis to apply a constant force so it can sort of ride over any undulations in the discs and yes that is a way to do it that is the way it is done um, you know commercial ones are just gravity holding them down a certain depth into the record and that avoids all of this fuss that this whole you know project has been about basically but I think that sort of detracts from the whole determinism tenant that is the diamond turning lathe so I wanted to try and you know make everything nice and geometrically good and do it that way but yeah this has been a fun little project I'm definitely going to keep working on it so I can make you know larger, larger size records and get the quality a little bit better. There's still some resonances uh, to get out of the actuator. A piezoelectric one would definitely be, uh, I think, a really good idea. I'll look into doing that in the future. But hope you found this little rabbit hole of a project interesting. I'll uh, see you next time.